Welcome back class to more Introduction to Material Science and Engineering and today we're going to start into the first of two lectures regarding mechanical failure of materials. So in our last lecture we talked about how to make materials strong and we touched on uh, that being mainly stopping the movement of dislocations in crystalline materials and stopping chain slippage past chains slipping past each other in the case of uh, thermoplastic polymer materials. But we did at least touch on a little bit some of the consequences of not allowing uh, movement, especially of dislocations in crystalline material, and that being uh, not having mechanisms to absorb energy and effectively making that material more fracture prone and brittle. So in the first part of this discussion, we'll be going into uh, more of what makes a brittle versus a ductile material, how they look, how we can describe uh, brittle failure versus ductile failure. Obviously we can still have things fail without necessarily failing in a brittle manner. Then we're going to try to get into a little bit more of the quantification of failure and touch on fracture mechanics and uh, the way we can use fracture mechanics test data and our understanding of pre-existing flaw size and distributions in materials to predict the relationship between applied stress and defect distribution in materials and whether or not they will spontaneously fracture and that's very very important for material design and we will stop this lecture at the end of that section and then we will pick up the second part of material failure with fatigue and creep in a second lecture. So getting into it, uh, mechanical failure will include pre-existing crack size distribution in real materials we talked about real materials not being perfect crystals or perfect polymers. Uh, they have vacancies and dislocations and grain boundaries and we talked about how those were advantages. The, uh, the pre-existing crack sizes that we'll be talking about now are actual cracks. These are our true defects. They are always deleterious. They, they are not uh, beneficial in any way. So these are true flaws. We'll talk about crack propagation in ductile versus brittle materials, uh, how they move, how cracks get bigger and why, and what can be done to stop them. We'll quantify material resistance to fracture, and that's using fracture mechanics. We'll look at the effects of environment on fracture resistance. Uh, some of you may have run across the uh, ideas of stress corrosion cracking and hydrogen embrittlement. Those are effects of the environment on the fracture toughness of the material very important for design. And then in the next lecture we'll look at the effect of cyclic loading, which is also known as fatigue failure, and then creep and thermal mechanical failure, which will sound very familiar from our viscoelastic discussion for polymers. Okay, fracture mechanisms. Uh, things can fail either in a ductile manner or a brittle manner, and they have very distinctive uh, appearances. If we take a uniaxial tensile sample, uh, like we learned about in our uh, mechanics of our mechanical properties of materials section, uh, round tensile bar, and we pull on it. Uh, over to the left, we have a very ductile material. It will extend, plastically deform. It'll probably neck, and come down to a point and break over a very small cross-sectional area uh, relative to the original cross-section. A brittle material, on the other hand, will only deform elastically little or no plastic deformation and then just snap. So it will retain almost the same exact cross-section that it had to start with and again of course all of its elastic uh, deformation will be recovered when it fails. Most typical materials, most of your most of your engineered metals will be somewhere in between shown in the uh, in the central gray schematic where you'll get some necking, some plastic deformation but not as much as we would say maybe with a viscoelastic polymer. So as we were saying at the beginning of this section all real materials have flaws and the flaw size determines the significance for fracture. So again these are not single atom vacancies. Uh, those are great if we're going to do alloying. They're important for diffusion as we noted in our mass transport section but that's too small to really have a have uh, a big effect on fracture. Dislocations are a little bit bigger and they're really important for deformation as we learned in our strengthening section but again they're too small to really have an effect on fracture. 
Grain boundaries, those are defects that are just on the lower end of the threshold of significance for fracture. Voids with a size that are similar to your material grains. So something, uh, a void, a, a crack, uh, something, a defect in the material that's about the same diameter as your average grain size. Those are the ones that are going to be very significant for fracture. That or obviously anything bigger. So there's kind of your, your threshold for how small can a flaw be and still have a big effect on a material's fracture toughness, fracture resistance. So think about the same diameter as your average grain size. Okay, what are the steps to material failure? We're going to go through this for a ductile material and a brittle material and the steps that they undergo between the very beginning of loading and complete parting are very, very different. So we're going to start with a ductile material. So this could be nice uh, ductile thermoplastic maybe, but more likely given the steps we'll go through, this is going to be a metal. So something like uh, low carbon steel or copper or aluminum. So we're going to, we're going to again think in terms of a round tensile bar. So we're pulling on this in our uniaxial tensile tester. So the first thing we'll do is have some elastic extension. We'll have some uniform uh, plastic deformation. And then we're going to get up to the point of ultimate tensile stress where we'll start to have that localized plastic deformation that we described as necking. And this is the onset of where we'll start to see a triaxial stress state. So we no longer really have uniaxial applied stress in that necked area. Now we, because, because of the presence of the neck alone, we now have stress in three directions, effectively along the, along the sample and then radially. This is very important because at this point now, this triaxial stress state is making it very, very difficult for dislocations in the necked area to keep moving. If dislocations can't move, the material effectively gets stronger, but if dislocations can't move and we just keep applying stress, so eventually energy is going to have to be dissipated in another way. And that way is by forming a surface, which is, of course, the next thing that happens. So if you go to the, uh, the next schematic over in the middle on the top row, you can see that as we have continued to increase the applied stress in that necked area, we've now started to form little cavities. And these are, are basically small, again, small defects in the material that were pre-existing uh, right along the same scale as the grain boundaries. They start to grow. As we continue to apply more and more stress, these will coalesce. Uh, they will, will join together and eventually form a macroscopic crack. Again, as we continue to apply more stress, that will propagate and eventually reach the point where we overload ductally and we actually, the final failure is shear failure and we'll form what's called shear lips on uh, the outer circumference of the material. And those are of course at 45 degrees to the uniaxial tensile direction. The outer skin of that material is in, in a less uh, triaxial stress state because it's on the surface. So it is seeing more just pure uniaxial tensile stress. So its final failure is at 45 degrees to that uniaxial stress. Like we, uh, same kind of idea we went over in the, the critical resolve shear stress in our, uh, in our strengthening mechanism section. If we look down at the failure surface, it usually has um, a lot of topography. It'll have a fibrous um, sort of appearance. And it'll also have little round cups that correspond to those original uh, microvoids that coalesced. Um, this is this fracture appearance often goes by the name of dimpling or microvoid coalescence. And in the case of the, the latter term, it, that's actually a description of the mechanism. The microvoids that were pre-existing in the material grow under the action of increasing stress in our triaxial necked area. They coalesce until they form a crack that can propagate and then the final failure around the outer circumference is shear. And here's what it looks like. So this is again our around uh, uniaxial tensile bar. And you can see that the, the outer circumference is the shear lip and it's kind of shiny and that has failed uh, ductally in shear. 
it's, you can see it's kind of at a 45 degree angle and that center portion that looks white and hazy it actually is uh, is very rough so it's not shiny and the SEM pictures in both cases uh, show first on the shear lip where we have some of those dimples that have been stretched in shear but the the SEM picture on the right uh, is is more from the center and you can see that it's uh, you know, it's very rough and you're actually looking straight down on those original microvoids. So the microvoids are actually the precursors to the crack. But overall, just in, in terms of the original size of the tensile sample, that failure surface has a lot of topography. And that is characteristic of the amount of plastic deformation that occurred in association with the failure because a lot of the mechanical strain energy that we put into that sample that was being applied by our tensile tester uh, went into deforming the material uh, it could absorb a lot of energy and so even though we eventually failed it um, this is called ductile failure and so this material if it were used in service it could absorb quite a bit of energy before fracturing and so it would have what would call a high, a high fracture toughness Okay, flip side, say we had something more like a ceramic. So in this case, we're showing the material with its pre-existing flaw distributions. So it's a, we have the, the pale green tensile sample. This could be maybe, uh, maybe a, a multi-crystalline ceramic or a very, very brittle metal, uh, maybe something like tungsten or iridium. And the dark green little ovals in it are a schematic representation of your flaws, your flaw distribution. So these are little cracks, little voids. Uh, if we sintered this as a ceramic or a powder metallurgy product, it would be the voids between the grains, the, the void space. So we're gonna we're gonna put this in our instron and we're gonna we're gonna start loading it up in uniaxial tension and uh, it's going to extend a little bit elastically according to Hooke's law with our Young's modulus related to our strain and as the stress increases we're eventually going to get to the point where one of those big flaws reaches the threshold for propagating and you can see we now have, have looking at those larger ovals kind of a, a third of the way down without any other plastic deformation in the sample, those just literally took off, joined, and propagated all the way across the sample. And now it's literally in two parts, the load drops, and we had catastrophic failure with little to no deformation. No warning, and more importantly, no other mechanism for absorbing energy. We put in uh, mechanical energy from our Instron, the sample absorbed it elastically, so the total energy absorbed would be the resilience alone, that triangular section on our stress strain curve under only the elastic section. And at some point before we could ever have any kind of plasticity or plastic deformation, before we moved to dislocation or, or put in any kind of permanent deformation, a couple of those big flaws reached a point where they could spontaneously propagate and the whole material failed. So this, these are the steps to brittle fracture. And you can see that even though the ductile fracture, the ductile failure, and the brittle both involved pre-existing flaws, the, the little microvoids in the case of the ductile microvoid coalescence, and these, these, uh, these little green pre-existing flaws that we're showing schematically on this diagram, they both involve pre-existing flaws, but in the case of the brittle fracture material, most of the failure onset in terms of the applied stress was really more of a function of the size of those flaws and their orientation relative to the applied stress. There wasn't anything else to absorb the energy we put into the material, so it was much more important what those, what those flaw sizes were. And of course we had no warning. So what does brittle failure look like? It's, uh, it's quite a bit different than the appearance of ductile failure. Uh, in general, the, uh, there's much less topography and uh, quite often fracture surfaces are studied fractally as a quantitative assessment of uh, the amount of energy that's necessary to propagate the, the cracks across. 
Um, and so that's, that's actually a way to quantify the topography and relate it to fracture energy. If you look in the, uh, in the lower left hand corner, there's a round tensile bar, very analogous to the one that we saw with uh, the round ductile failure with the shear lips. This one looks flat across. It's got a little bit of a sugar crystal-y appearance. There's a very small amount of, uh, of roughness and topography. But most important, there are no shear lifts, lips. There was, because there was no ductile failure, uh, there was very little deviation of the crack going straight across. It had, it had very little reason to change direction. So it almost looks like a, a perpendicular fracture surface. In practice, we'll get a, quite often a chevron appearance, where if you trace uh, the pattern of the chevrons back, quite often you can find the initiation point. That's not always the case, but it, it's certainly a tool that can be used to try to identify what may have, uh, may have been the initiation cause. Uh, quite often it's a surface defect, a, a corrosion pit, or even a, a fatigue initiator, which we'll talk more about later. But generally, to recap, ductile fracture, lots of topography, usually shear lips out on the outer surface, brittle fracture, much, much smoother, and, and uh, much more straight across, perpendicular to uh, whatever the tensile loading axis was. Okay, F getting further into types of brittle fracture, if we have a multi-grain material, like a polycrystalline metal or a ceramic, but mostly we'll be discussing metals because we're pretty sure that ceramics are brittle. So thinking about a polycrystalline material, if you have a crack propagating in a brittle manner, very little deformation going on, it can either go through grains or it can go around grains on the grain boundaries. So if the crack passes straight through the middle of grains, we call this transgranular brittle crack propagation. If it goes Along the grain boundaries, we call that intergranular. So pretty much just like the words say. So on the left-hand side, we have sort of a cross-section schematic of the way uh, the crack, which is the red line, would pass. So you can see it's passing through the grains. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, an SEM shot of a fracture surface looking at the top down. And the, uh, the surface you're seeing looks like it might be grain boundaries, but what you're really seeing is the contrast in the orientation of the grains. Um, this actually went straight through each one of those grains with, uh, without really passing through the boundaries in any case. So we can contrast that with intergranular, with again the schematic on the left hand side and then a top down SEM shot on the right. And this is the real sugar crystal uh, looking appearance where you are you are literally seeing almost the 3D surface of, of of the grain structure of the material. This is very very characteristic of hydrogen uh, embrittlement, uh, hydrogen induced cracking, and stress corrosion cracking. So when we see this on a failure surface, we immediately start wondering whether or not this material was used in, in the wrong environment, especially for metals. Okay general conditions that favor brittle fracture. So this would be true for any given material. Uh, obviously, some materials will tend to fail in a brittle manner regardless of what we do, like ceramics or, or tungsten or very brittle, brittle metals or heavily, heavily cross-linked network polymers. But a lot of materials could behave either way depending on how they're loaded and the conditions under which they're loaded. So for those kind of in-between materials, we can consider things that will tend to make them fail in a brittle manner and things that will tend to allow them to, to fail in a more ductile manner and give them a higher fracture toughness, which we generally want in service. And all of these conditions are 100% relatable to how easy it is for the material to deform instead of simply forming a surface in order to accommodate the imposed stress, especially stress near the tips of those pre-existing flaws. So you can think about the conditions for brittle fracture as being the conditions that make it difficult to move a dislocation or slip a polymer chain. And I have you know a little three three word uh, memory aid for this. 
I usually call it colder, faster, crowded. And another way to consider crowded is more constrained. So colder, obviously, um, if a material is colder, there's less thermal vibration. All of the processes that allow movement on a microstructural or molecular level are slower. Uh, although it, uh, it dislocation movement is very quick uh, in terms of a time process, it's not as fast as elastic deformation. It really does take a little bit of time for a dislocation to index over uh, one unit. It's not a lot of time, but it's, it's not instantaneous. So if we apply load very, very fast or we, uh, we get a material very cold, there's not enough time or enough thermal energy for uh, those dislocation movements to keep up with the increasing load, the increasing energy we're adding to the material, and so they can't move. And if they can't move, obviously, we're going to get brittle behavior. So that's colder and faster. More constrained refers to the number of different directions from which we're loading the material. We talked about the center of those necked areas on a uniaxial tensile sample in the case of a metal being in a triaxial stress state. So the more different directions in which we apply, especially a tensile stress, the more difficult it is to move a dislocation. We have more tensile stress, we have less shear. So if we're loading a material from only one direction like we do in our uniaxial tensile samples prior to necking, they might be fairly ductile. If we grabbed it from the sides and we yanked from the top and the sides at the same time, we'd see that we got far, far less plastic deformation. It wouldn't elongate as much and it would fail much sooner and in a more brittle manner. So that's what the state of constraint means. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in, with respect to uh, plane stress and plane strain. Those are more qualitative assessments of the state of constraint or the extent of multi-axial loading that a material can undergo simply because of its thickness. So for any given macroscopic loading, uh, the closer to the center of a real thick piece of material uh, you are, the more effectively you'll be in a multi-axis loading state. If you're way out on the surface, um, just your conditions of static equilibrium say that you can only be loaded in two ways because obviously you can't impose a load or a stress from the surrounding air. So everything on the surface or anything in a very, very thin material uh, will tend to be in a, at most a biaxial or uniaxial stress state. And this is one of the reasons why thin, thin coatings uh, will act much more ductily than a monolithic thick part. And it's why we can use brittle ceramics in thin coatings much easier than we can in thick sections. And I think we might have discussed that with material selection and why we would use a ceramic coating as opposed to a thick ceramic part for a, a pump housing. In any case, if we want to make something ductile, we keep it warm, we load it slowly, and we make sure that it's, uh, it's only loaded in one direction at a time. Uh, it's not constrained. Go with uniaxial rather than multi-axis stress. Okay. Crack opening modes and part thickness. This is a little bit of vocabulary that's usually used with respect to fracture testing, and it's relatable to the way we use materials in the field. So you can think about a, if we have a material that has a crack or that we're loading, we can either apply a stress that will open the crack, sort of like the mouth of an alligator, which you can see on, that's in figure number one. We can put it into a front to back shear uh, state, like you see in the schematic number two, or we can apply shear in kind of a tearing mode, like you see in uh, schematic number three. Those are kind of the three ways, you know, or the three orthogonal directions in which we can apply stress to, uh, to a pre-existing crack in a material. The one that is most likely to make that crack propagate for a given unit of stress, like say we apply, you know, 10 pascals in each of those three different directions, that 10 pascals is far more likely to propagate that crack if it's loaded in the, in the alligator mouth over on mode one. That is the most severe loading mode 
stress per stress, material for material, and uh, pre-existing crack length, pre-existing crack length. So quite often when you you read about fracture toughness test data, you will hear about mode one loading. And the, the other default a worst case scenario, of course, is the higher level of constraint, which is called plain strain. And that merely means that your material is thick enough that you're likely to encounter a triaxial stress state at the crack tip. So it basically means you had a, a fairly thick piece of material, which is typical for most tensile specimens. If you had a real thin one, real thin material, that would be uh, plain stress. Great for application, but if you're testing, you want to do a test that captures the worst conditions you're likely to see in the field. So when we talk about crack opening modes and part thicknesses, and we're looking up fracture data, like a fracture toughness um, benchmark data for a given material, we're going to look for a test that was done with mode one loading and that was done on a test sample in a plain strain condition. So mode one, plain strain is going to be the most conservative condition and if the test was performed that way it's going to be bounding for almost any kind of similar temperature and environment condition that we would put that material in in the field. So there's the role of crack opening modes and part thickness with respect to test data. Give a quick, there we go, next slide. Apologies for the interruption. Okay, stepping back from the crack tip and thinking a little bit more macroscopically. Um, if we have a real part, it's probably not a uniaxial cylindrical uh, test bar. It probably has some geometry to it. And anytime we introduce some complex geometry into a part, we have the potential for introducing stress concentrators. And these are very, very important for understanding what the real stress state is in a material. And we will take this to kind of a, a more extreme conclusion and actually look at the stress state at the tip of an atomistically sharp, very small crack. But we can use that same concept of stress concentrators to look at macroscopic design features like holes and thread roots and fillets and, and section thicknesses um, that that aren't flaws but are actually design features in a material. So a stress concentrator is defined or described basically as the stress at a geometric discontinuity that is much higher than in the bulk loaded material. So if you have a stress uh, sigma infinity on an infinite plate, you have a huge plate of material, say in a pressure vessel, and you're yanking on it, and, and it's enormous, and you have a small hole drilled through it. And you want to know what the stress state is immediately adjacent to that hole. It's going to be three times higher than the average stress that's being applied to that big semi-infinite plate, three times. So again, if we're applying uh, 100 megapascals to the entire plate, you're going to have 300 megapascals right adjacent to that circular crack. Excuse me, circular hole. If it were a crack, it would probably be higher. And we will get to that in a minute. One way of thinking about why that's the case is if you're used to looking at stream flow or looking at contour lines, maybe in, in the flow, say, of a river. Uh, if you imagine the stress, isostress contours in that plate being like uh, like flow lines in a stream going around like a big rock in a stream, uh, the water is going to have to move much faster right adjacent to that rock to maintain continuity because it had to divert around it. If you remember that from uh, the law of continuity in, in fluids and physics. So those isostress contours are going to be much closer together around that hole. So that's another way of looking at the concept of a stress concentrator and, and why they work the way they do, why stresses at these discontinuities and feature changes in a material are, or in a, in a geometry, in a design material, are so much higher than the average. It's just sort of a way of thinking about it. Here's another shape of feature that causes a stress concentrator and these are a little bit more general so 
imagine you have rather than a circular hole you have an elliptical hole and so it would be defined by its ellipse geometry of 2b in versus 2a and its tight radius uh, could be described as a circle with a radius of r so the ratio of the average stress over that whole big thick plate the sigma infinity to the stress right at the edge of that elliptical hole is going to be defined as up there as k sub t called the stress concentration factor and that's defined of course as sigma max which is again the stress right next to that uh, that tighter radius on the ellipse over the average stress over the whole plate which is sigma infinity and that's equal to 1 plus 2 times the square root of a which is the long radius of the ellipse over r which is the radius of curvature right at the tight radius of the ellipse of course if a equals r we have a circle instead of an ellipse and we go back to the formula that we had for the circular hole on the other page there is a kt that can be defined for almost any type of geometrical discontinuity thread roots holes section thicknesses you name it but generally the concept is the the more sharp the discontinuity or the more abrupt the section thickness the higher the stress concentration factor so this gives us a, this slide shows two different stress concentration factors we have a section thickness where we have um, a, a t-shaped part that's being pulled in one direction and so we go from a width of w to a width of h and so the ratio of the max stress in that part to the average stress sigma zero that's being applied over the top is going to be proportional to the difference in those two widths w over h so the higher that ratio the higher the stress concentration factor and that's being shown in the increasing height of the different curves in the direction of that gray arrow that shows increasing w over h we have a second factor here and that's the fillet radius so for any given change in section thickness say say that's fixed you can't really change the ratio of w to h maybe that's that's part of the design that you can't do anything about well then at the very least you can put a very large fillet radius on that and walk yourself a little further out that curve on the x-axis so you can see there the the ratio of the the width in the narrow section h to the fillet radius r as that increases we drop our stress concentration factor quite a bit and in fact for um, for a very small radius to uh, lower section thickness we're we're going to walk up those curves decrease um, the value of our x-axis and get up into a very steep part of the curve so uh, from this actually the the better way to drop that stress concentration factor is to really increase r the fillet radius in the case of this particular geometry so again two different ways to change your stress concentration factor and from the standpoint of fracture and, and material failure in general, we, we want stress concentration factors in our designs to be as low as possible. We really want the average applied stress to be the highest stress in the part uh, for any design. That's, that's obviously never going to be true because we can't design perfect smooth parts with no section thicknesses but we certainly want to keep those KTs as small as possible because they can have enormous consequences on the stress state in an actual real design and push us over yield or as we'll see uh, as we go along get us into a state where we're going to have a fracture problem so along the lines of fracture problems now we get to jump into a little bit of the mathematics and theory of fracture mechanics and this is a fairly a fairly new field in some ways uh, some of its older but there's been a lot of studies on how to actually quantify the relationship between either energy or stress in a given uh, applied generally over a part to um, to the criteria for the onset of failure by either brittle or ductal fracture and there's really generally historically been two approaches to looking at this one is we call the energy balance 
uh, approach and the other is stress state at the crack tip. And anyone who remembers your physics or who's taken dynamics, you're aware that there's generally two ways to approach a lot of mechanics problems, either an energy method, say where we, where we keep the total energy change equal to zero and equate potential and kinetic energies. That's the approach used in the energy balance uh, for failure onset by fracture. Uh, we can also look at things from the standpoint of forces and stresses and strains, and that's uh, really what we do with the stress state at the crack tip, where we try to look at the actual, excuse me, the actual stress is right at the crack tip, and then relate that to the applied load, very similar to the way we looked at stress concentrators, except at really at an atomistic level, right next to uh, a very sharp, microscopic crack in the microstructure. And so the important factors there are the crack length, which again is going to be on the same size probably as a grain, a grain length, but it could be bigger. We'll relate that in that case to the applied stress. And the, the crack specific geometry becomes important with that approach. And in that case we'll come out with something called a critical stress intensity. In the case of the energy balance, we'll go over uh, we'll go over concepts like the Griffith strain energy release rate criteria. These two are obviously related, and for certain simplified cases, they equate to one another. But uh, looking ahead, it was it's really the stress state at the crack tip approach that has become most prevalent, and that for which you will find the most data. And that's probably how most of your designs will go, and that's what we'll cover the most in the class. But we're going to use the energy balance as a way to simply understand the concepts that go into crack propagation because it's a lot easier to understand conceptually. Both approaches are correct, both approaches are valid, but most of the, the bulk of test data and, uh, and computational modeling analysis have gone into the stress state of the crack tip approach. So that's where we'll, we'll do most of our examples and we'll define a term called the K1C relating stress, stress state average in the material to uh, the average flaw size and whether or not a crack will spontaneously propagate. But we're going to start with energy. So boy we can go right back to our first discussion of, of bond energy for this. It, it, it keeps coming back, back to bonding. We can think about the onset of failure, or the criteria for fracture, as whether or not we have added enough mechanical energy to a material to form a new surface by breaking bonds. So the energy necessary for fracture is the energy for bond rupture, which we can also think of as the energy to create new surfaces. So for a given crack, uh, we're looking at again at a big thick plate of material, it has a thickness of B, it extends out, uh, up and across effectively infinitely. We're going to yank on it with a stress sigma, only in one direction, and it has a crack all the way through uh, of a length of A. So the bond energy that we are overcoming to propagate that crack from a length of A to a longer length, um, or to initiate it to, to create that crack in the first place, uh, more specifically, is going to be equal to the total surface area, which is A, 2A times B, because you got a top surface and a bottom in the crack, times the surface energy. And in this case, it's the surface between the material and the air. So uh, if you remember in our discussion of why dislocations are so essential to allow for deformation of materials, we discuss the energy necessary to displace an entire plane of atoms across um, a shear plane and how that energy would exceed the amount of energy necessary to form a surface and therefore would exceed the fracture energy. This is the energy to form the surface to which we were referring back then and so that can be equated to the bond energy. So ultimately to if we have no other way of absorbing energy we can say that the energy to propagate a crack is merely the energy to create a new surface. If that were the case, most materials would not survive in service. And uh, that's in fact the equating uh, fracture energy to merely energy to create a new surface. That's only the case for very, very brittle materials like some, some very brittle ceramics. 
in reality, we have a lot more ways to absorb energy in materials, thank goodness, other than just creating surfaces, because it's not a lot of energy to create a surface. For any kind of material that can plastically deform, we will absorb a tremendous amount more energy deforming that material than we will creating a new surface. Now for propagating a crack, we're not going to be able to deform the material generally. So in this case, we're talking about plastic deformation just in a localized zone right in front of the crack tip. And that's shown in the, uh, the, the pink circle over on our left-hand schematic that says plastic deformation zone. You might ask yourself, why, why is this limited? I mean, if it's a ductile material, ductile materials can accommodate, what, 20, 50 percent you know, strain at failure. Why such a small deformation zone? Remember that right at the tip of a crack, we actually have a triaxial stress state. It's very, very constrained. So unfortunately, we, we can't get a lot of plasticity. So that plastic deformation zone is actually pretty small. But it will also vary with the material as well as with the geometry of the crack. So the more ductile the material, the bigger that plastic deformation zone will be for any given crack geometry. So now if we start adding up the energy responsible uh, for breaking bonds and for propagating that crack and we write it in terms of the stress for failure rather than just the energy to break a bond, we see we got two main components. We now have the stress at failure needing to be more than our two main modes of absorbing energy for a given crack length. So the components we have on the right hand side of our upper equation are two times, now we have two energies. One is the sigma sub, sub s, excuse me, uh, different Greek symbol. The energy to create a new surface, which has an, a subscript s, and the deformation energy with the subscript p for plasticity. So that's moving dislocations or slipping chains a little bit past one another. So that's all those modes of moving uh, plastically within the material. Then we have the elastic modulus over pi times the pre-existing crack length. And all of that in that parentheses being raised to the one half. So that's the actual applied stress necessary to fail. So you can think of the main components as being an elastic strain component with our elastic modulus, crack length uh, to the one half power in the denominator, and then our two modes of absorbing energy, creating surfaces and, and plastic deformation. We can write that again, simply the upper part that's related to our energy absorption mechanisms as a critical energy release rate, and this is the energy release per unit advancement of the crack. In this case, it's uh, the rate isn't a time dependence, it's, um, it's a crack advancement dependence. So it would be a dx rather than a dt. So that g sub c critical energy release rate is two times the two energy absorption mechanisms, the surface energy, excuse me, surface creation and plastic deformation, of which the plastic deformation is a lot bigger. Okay, so that was it for energy mechanisms. Main takeaways being to, to advance a crack, we dump energy into the system, mainly taking the form of elastic strain energy, similar to what we saw around dislocations and solutes. That can then be apportioned to creating a surface or to moving dislocations and other plasticity mechanisms. So now we're going to focus on a uh, crack tip stress state and this will be the beginning of deriving an expression for what we call K1C or critical strain energy release rate. Uh, critical for mode 1, plain strain and this is the major data benchmark that you will look for in fracture toughness data for a specific material. So we're going to talk a little bit about where K1Cs come from, what they mean, how they relate specifically to applied design stresses, pre-existing flaw sizes, how they're tested, and how to use them. So starting at the beginning, crack tip stress state. 
just like a stress intensity factor from a whole or a macro design defect, or not a defect, excuse me, a design feature, the stress state at the crack tip is much, much higher than the average applied stress. And in fact, it's much higher even than a geometric discontinuity like a through hole, rivet hole, or a section thickness change. It's even bigger. It's a strong function of crack length and the proximity to the crack tip. So we're imagining the stress state in a material somewhere out ahead of an advancing crack and looking at how it changes from some place infinitely far away from the crack tip and then how it gets bigger and bigger as we get closer to the crack tip. So we're going to kind of imagine we're walking through the material that's stressed and how the stress state that we would see depends on our location relative to that pre-existing crack. So if we start over on the left hand side we have a schematic of a material that's an infinitely large plate again and it's now being loaded in two directions. This is biaxial loading. So we have sigma infinity which means basically the average bulk applied stress out on the edge of the plate. It's being loaded in both the x and the y directions and it's got a, a, an, a sharp crack meaning that we're assuming it's atomistically sharp at the tip. We're not defining a radius. We're figuring at the tip it's it's just literally coming up on the the equilibrium interatomic spacing of, of two atoms in, in the lattice of whatever crystal you're in. And it starts out with a length of 2a. So if we're wandering through the material and we'll move over to the right hand diagram and you can see the the crack position is located down on the x-axis from 0 to a. So the origin of this graph is now kind of centered over the center of the crack. And if we are at any position on the in the x direction relative to that crack tip, uh, what would be the stress that we would see at our particular location? Well, if we were, and this is in terms of the ratio of the stress that we would see versus the applied stress on, on the whole plate. If we're at 3a, way out ahead of the crack, so if we're at three times one half of the crack length or three halves of the total crack length, out in front of the crack, material that has not cracked yet, we wouldn't really see too much more than the average stress being applied to the plate. We're, we're worried about the bulk average. But if we started walking closer and closer to the crack, this is an imaginary scenario where we're walking through crystal lattice, basically, as we got to within uh, 1a of the crack tip getting approaching it, our, our actual stress state would start shooting through the roof. And the ratio of the stress state we would be experiencing at that location compared to the bulk applied stress, the stress infinity, would be the square root of pi times the crack length over the square root of 2 pi times how far away from that crack tip we were out in front of it. So we're seeing now a dependence the localized stress state in front of that crack is dependent on the length of the crack and how far away from the crack we really were. So the closer we are the higher the stress and the longer the original crack length, the higher the stress relative to whatever we applied. Now remember, if you're designing a material, you can only control what's applied to the edge of that material or macroscopic stress application. You can control sigma infinity. But what's going to propagate the crack is the sigma yy that you see on that right-hand diagram. We're talking about what's going to make a crack spontaneously propagate. It's the stress state right at that crack tip that matters. And that's why there's a whole discussion in this section and a whole field of fracture mechanics that tries to calculate that. So let's look a little harder at our, at our semi-infinite plate with our elliptical crack. Uh, we have basically the same figure over in the lower left-hand corner of this slide. This is our same plate. It's got some thickness, it's infinitely large in two directions, and we're yanking on it with sigma infinity in two directions at once. So here's our biaxial loaded, um, loaded plate. We can define what's called a stress intensity factor 
for a through crack in this semi-infinite plate. So this is just for this particular loading scenario, through crack of total length 2a. This is effectively the same expression with a little bit different words. Rather than saying sigma yy, we're now saying sigma crack tip. So we're saying the stress at the crack tip or near the crack tip, near the crack tip, is equal to the applied stress on the whole material, again with our square root of pi times the crack length over square root of 2 pi times how far away we are, again out ahead of that crack. If we take just the numerator of that expression and define it as its own constant, we're now defining something that's independent of location in the material and just calling out what we applied, which we could control, and some measure of how big the crack was to begin with. So now we're kind of taking out the part that had to do with where we were relative to the crack and just talking about what load did we apply and how big the crack was to start with. So we're defining that constant K as your applied load, excuse me, applied stress, applied load for unit area, times the square root of pi times the square root of your pre-existing crack length. We can generalize this to other loading scenarios, other crack um, shapes and geometries other than just a semi-infinite plate and an elliptical crack. And when we do that, we define K a little bit differently, but it has the same essential components. So if we define a stress intensity factor generally that can be used for real parts, we define it as K means the same thing, stress intensity factor equals Y times sigma design, which is the applied stress to the whole part, times the square root of A, which is the crack length again. But in this case, Y, rather than just being the square root of pi, it's a general geometric factor, which includes the geometry of the part and the geometry of the crack relative to the loading direction. And it's different for every type, shape, size of crack. And in most cases, it will roll in any kind of geometric stress intensity factors like a smooth through hole or a section thickness or a fillet or a thread root. So an example of that is a little crack at the side of a hole like you would see in a rivet. So you'll have holes that are used to, uh, to fasten parts together with rivets. This used to be used uh, quite a bit for uh, fuselages in aircraft and also in, in structural steel uh, for buildings, especially skyscrapers, old building designs and methods. So if you have a shallow crack coming off of a circular rivet hole, it will have a K that's equal to 1.12 times 3, both just constants, times pi to the 1 half, times your design, your applied design stress, so you can see this being applied to the whole plate, times the crack length, not, not the whole radius, uh, the crack length raised to the 1 half. So if you look at that 3, that should look really similar to the stress intensity factor for a circular hole. So the y in this case would be 1.12 times pi to the 1 half times 3. So this would include the effect of the hole to begin with, and it would include the effect of the crack and its orientation to the, to the applied stress. If the crack got deeper, you would have a completely different expression for y. And in this case, you would roll your square root dependence of a in with a y, and you would end up having the expression there for a deep crack. And that is, again, just for that particular geometry. You will have a different y for every specific different combination of crack or flaw geometry relative to loading. Uh, how to use this in practice, you relate your probable y to one that you can find in the literature. And uh, in, this, in this sense, practical application of fracture mechanics and fracture toughness data is, is it's very test driven. So a lot of the magic here and designing it and applying it properly is relating your stress state, your flaw distribution to one that's been tested and verified.
and we will do a little bit of practice with that. So speaking of testing, how the heck do you get these k values and how do they relate to a material? I mean so far we've only looked at crack length and applied load and geometry. Isn't this a materials class? Well absolutely. If we do several tests and we establish k for a variety of crack lengths and a variety of loads all with the same y, we will end up with something that is indeed specific to the material. And that's what we call k-critical. And that is a material-specific property, just like elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, yield stress, ultimate tensile strength, whatever. So that's where we start to get material-specific. So k-critical is specific to the material, and it is equal to a geometry factor times the test stress that was applied times the square root of the crack length. So we actually this time have a material property that is itself dependent on more than just chemistry and processing, but is also dependent on flaw size distribution. This is very different than every other material property we've defined to date. Everything from corrosion resistance to yield stress to elastic modulus, all of our mechanical properties certainly have been specific only to bond state and processing. Now we have something that's specific to that plus how big is our largest average flaw or how big is our largest flaw most specifically. That is the biggest difference between fracture toughness defined by k-critical and any other material and you, you simply have to include both. You will have a k-critical for the material and you will also, in addition to that k-critical, need to know what your largest flaw size is to deploy it properly. Well, let's start with how we got that k-critical in the first place because if it's dependent on the flaw size and the geometry, how, how did we ever come up with it? And the answer is a lot of testing. So fracture, uh, material specific fracture data is very expensive to obtain. It's not as prolific as yield and tensile stress. Um, and uh, when you can find it, you use it. It's, it's very valuable. So the way you get this is you design multiple test specimens that have the same Y. So you'll have the same macroscopic geometry and you'll have the same test specimen geometry, especially relative to your loading direction. Many of these are controlled by ASTM standards. There's a lot of different standard fracture samples, uh, compact tensile being one of the most common. You will then add a sharp crack of a known length to the test sample before you ever start applying stress for the test. And in order to add a sharp crack of a known length, you use fatigue, which is actually a failure mechanism, but you will apply it in a controlled way so that you know what your starting crack length is. So once you have a set Y test and a set A that you know, you'll load the material up and you'll measure the stress at which it breaks. And you'll do that again and again for uh, different crack lengths and you'll end up with a single K critical, which is then specific to the material. So that is how you end up getting the material specific component of all of this fracture scenario. Okay, so how do I use this? K critical for fracture sensitive design. Well, let's assume that we have a shallow crack emanating from a rivet hole. Maybe we're designing something that's riveted and we know that it's got some cracks in the rivet holes. So we know that we're in mode one loading. So it's a K1 and that's back to that different crack opening modes. So we know the expression for K for our fracture toughness would be in this case 3.36, which was our 1.12 times three times pi to the one half times our design stress times our, uh, our largest flaw size in the material raised to the one half. Let's assume we have a couple of material choices. We have aluminum 7075T651 and it has a K1 critical which means its fracture toughness in the mode 1 loading under plane strain conditions the critical uh, stress intensity factor K for that material is 24.4 megapascals meters to the one half. 
Fracture toughness, K1Cs are called out in stress times length units to the one half, and that's because of that A to the one half. Our second material choice is much higher, 115.4 megapascals meters to the one half, and that's titanium in this case. Could have been any material, they'll all have their own material specific K1C. Let's assume that we have two different two different processes to make our part, whatever it is. One process is, um, it is not very good quality control, and we end up having uh, a minimum detectable flaw size of one millimeter. Or maybe we have uh, the same quality, but we have different non-destructive evaluation methods. So in the first case, we, uh, we can only detect flaws that are one millimeter or larger. So we have to assume we have a flaw of one millimeter. In another case, either we have better processing, but we don't have as large a flaws in the material, or we can detect, we have a flaw size detection that's better. So we can be sure in, in the second case that we don't have any flaws that are any bigger than 0 0.01 millimeters. Well, if we plug those two A's into our K1 expression, we can solve for a design stress that would make sure that the K applied did or didn't get above the K1 critical for the material. So if we look at our first expression in our calculation, looking at combinations of material and flaw size, we start with, let's look at what it would take in terms of design stress to exceed K critical for aluminum, which is the 24.4 megapascals meters to one half. So we would have our K applied expression with our Y, 3.36, pi to the one half. We'd multiply that by our design stress. And if we had uh, the larger minimum detectable flaw size, we'd have to put in a millimeter for our A, which is 0 0.001 meters. So that would be aluminum with a one millimeter flaw. If the design stress in that case caused the ex the right-hand side of the expression to exceed 24.2 times 10 to the 6 pascals meters to the 1 half, we would have spontaneous crack propagation in that design and it would fail by fracture. So we can continue that same argument using a different flaw size or a different K1C. And you can see that we can apply the sigma design, which is sigma design 4 there on the bottom, is the highest if we have the material with the highest K1C and the lowest flaw size. And in this case, you can easily see just looking at the equation, the relationship between K1C, applied design stress, and flaw size, it's not the same uh, order in the equation. K1C and design stress are both linear terms, and the flaw size is to the one half. So K1C is going to have a much bigger impact on your safe applicable design stress than flaw size, um, but quite often flaw size is more difficult to detect since you it is processing dependent, whereas K1C is material dependent, and if you have test data, you can know what that is for sure. So just a word on defect size detection, since this is as important as your K1C effectively in determining how much load you can apply to a material before it fractures. Uh, fracture critical design must incorporate a defect size detection capability. It does no good to simply say you must use a material with this K1C if you don't, if you don't specify the largest allowable flaw size. I mean obviously if you can't detect flaws that are very big, you better go with a material with a higher K1C in order to accommodate a given design load. They're related. Now we know how they're related. So this chart is out of the Callister textbook and it just gives you a little order of magnitude idea of the flaw size detection capabilities of different, uh, different lab and field methods. And this is probably out of date enough at the time of this lecture recording, which is January 2019. Some of these have probably gotten a bit better uh, in terms of the field tests, but uh, something like an SEM, which would probably be more applicable for uh, 
destructive evaluation, something that's already failed, which we're trying to prevent. You could have something that's on the uh, order of a micron. Uh, dipenetrant, which is a very easy in the field technique. Uh, you've got uh, in the, the hundreds of millimeters. Of course, this is only capable of detecting surface flaws. Ultrasonic, uh, about double the detection limit on the average, but it's much better for subsurface defects. Optical, good for surface defects again, very usable in the field, uh, a tenth to half a millimeter. Very, very good visual, can get you to within a tenth of a millimeter. You know, that's obviously um, kind of part and parcel with optical microscopy. Acoustic emission, more laboratory based, uh, not much better actually. And then radiographic, which is x rays, uh, sometimes gamma ray uh, transmission. And that's obviously subsurface, and it can be anywhere around 2% of the specimen thickness. And again, that's much, obviously, much better for small parts that can go through a radiographic facility. Not so good for the field, but uh, could be very valuable for a manufacturing scenario. So uh, if you're taking this course, you will very likely get one or more exercises utilizing the definition of K applied and K1 critical to uh, basically balance average flaw size and applicable uh, design stress. You will almost in every case be using a safety factor with that to account for the fact that you can certainly never be totally sure of what your largest flaw size is and also all of the other unknowns in the design and uh, Design safety factors were part of our uh, our mechanical properties discussion earlier in this course, and we will definitely be revisiting that with any kind of exercises having to do with fracture. Okay, and that is it for this lecture. It's definitely been a long one. Uh, just to wrap up, the most important coverage we've had is uh, the concept of brittle failure, a low energy absorption materials, uh, the inability to ductally deform or to plastically deform being basically the, the biggest reason you would encounter brittle failure, and then the fracture mechanics uh, that led up to the ability to define a K1C, a, a critical fracture toughness that was material specific that could nonetheless only be used with an understanding of the pre-existing flaw size, its relationship to applied design stress. So in the next lecture, we will cover a little bit of high rate toughness testing, and it's a bit of a shortcut to the very expensive involved fracture mechanics testing necessary to establish a K1C. It is qualitative or semi-quantitative, but uh, very cheap and very quick and sometimes just as useful, depending on what you're doing. And then we'll segue into our, uh, our other more specific failure modes of fatigue and creep and probably give a little bit of attention to environmental uh, failure and uh, the problems we would encounter if our K1C changed in service. So exciting for our next lecture. See you then.